Hello, it's Kyle, back with Give Paws Hobby for another look at a Rootbot. Our first actual faction in the reboot of the series here, the Mechanical Marquise 2.0. So if you have the Mechanical Marquise from the Riverfolk expansion, put it away. We're not going to be talking about it. Um, why is my collar that way? That's a little better. Um, so it is the first... Uh, you know, the cats are the ones who set up first. They're the first faction uh, in the rule book. They're the first faction you notice when you look at a game of Root because they're everywhere. But honestly, they're also, I think, even if none of those things were true, I think it's still the best faction to start with because it's pretty straightforward how you actually read these rules and implement the faction. And if you're using the reach values in terms of getting a game that's viable, um, this has a reach of 10. So the Mechanical Marquise 2.0 really fills a lot of gaps, allows people to use some of the insurgent factions while maybe one other person is doing a militant one. Um, it's also just a really simple uh, other party to put into the game to sort of, it's almost like a, a lit fuse or a ticking clock. Um, not that I actually feel like they are guaranteed to actually close out the game because, spoiler alert, they're not the strongest of the Rootbot factions, but they're really great to use. Super low overhead, I think. And, um, you know, like I said, they're kind of iconic in the Root world, um, being the little angry orange cats all over the, the field. So without any further ado, let's actually get into it. Now, a quick uh, reminder, if there are mistakes that I make, um, you know, I have a pretty good grasp on how this faction works. I don't always have as good a grasp on how my brain and my voice works. So if I misspeak, um, make sure you have the Klingon subtitles on. If I discover there's a mistake that I said, um, I'll put something down below. If I completely like forget a whole part of the faction board or something ridiculous, there will be an episode one point whatever. Um, fingers crossed. I never have to do that for anything. But if you see it pop up, that's why it's there. So the other thing, as a reminder, uh, I will be showing overviews, uh, little pictures from the actual faction board. But the, uh, what do you call them? Timestamps down below are going to be the chapters that reference to the law of rootbotics. So if uh, lots of times they're, you know, obviously they're the same rules, but if one of the two is going to be more expansive about the rule, it's going to be the law of rootbotics. So I will show you what you're gonna be using during the game here on the video, but I will be organizing it in the same way that you will find it in the law of rootbotics. So if there's something that I'm not saying super clearly, I'm helping you out, showing you exactly where to look in the law to find out. So with that, uh, first of all, the name, the Mechanical Marquise 2.0. So uh, for anyone who's been in the woodland for long enough, you know the 2.0 is not just a uh, throwaway, kind of make it sound uh, more mechanical or you know digital or whatever. There was a Mechanical Marquise 1.0, and that's the one that came in the River Folk expansion. I will not be covering that here um, personally, even though I owned the River Folk expansion before I got the Clockwork one. I never played with the original Mechanical Marquise robot, um, but I've been told that this, if you're going to do one of them, this is it. So I've just never returned to it, actually experienced it myself. I guess maybe that's a, a ding on my street cred, but or woodland cred, um, but be that what it may, that's where the name comes from, in case you were just wondering. All right, so 4.1, um, the overview of, whoop, hold on, I need to get my law of robotics. So this is the simplest of the bots and can be used to fill out the player count in dozens of configurations. See what I tell you. Though this bot is straightforward, don't get complacent, at least one player will need to keep it in check. Um, so that is the kind of setup for the Mechanical Marquise, and let's uh, move on. So the uh, faction 4.2, the faction rules and abilities. We have the same poor manual dexterity and hates surprises, excuse me, as we do in all the root bots. 
Um, so that should come as no surprise. The one that's different, the keep, is the same as it works for the meatbag cat players, which is to say you can't place a piece, a new piece, into the clearing with the keep, though you can move into it. And once the keep is lost, then it is gone forever. There is no getting it back. And um, on that point, while us humans may have a reason to prioritize keeping the keep, um, for instance, hospitals is a good example, rather than uh, keeping a building. If someone kind of makes their way into the clearing and attacks, the robot will always lose the keep before any buildings. Because remember, in battle, uh, the robot removes warriors first. If there are no more warriors and there are tokens and buildings, the tokens will go first. Uh, and then, again, if there are, you know, more than one type of building, you randomize that. There will never be more than one type of token because the uh, spoiler, Mechanical Marquis 2.0 does not use wood tokens. So the only token they have is the keep. So if you score a hit beyond the warriors, boom, keep is gone and is not coming back. All right, 4.3 setup. So gather warriors, this is as usual, but you will not gather wood tokens because the bot doesn't use them. You're gonna place the keep in a random corner. Obviously the root bot is not going to choose. So I usually choose a random corner, roll the die, and that first corner I chose is a zero. And then I go clockwise around the map to figure out where uh, is their chosen corner. Your garrison is slightly different than the meatbag version of the, uh, the cats. Because while you will be in all uh, clearings minus the one opposite the keep, this is not ad set set up, so you're still not having that cat in that opposite corner, you will have an extra cat in the clearing with the keep. So two cats in that clearings, in that clearing, no cats in the opposite corner clearing, and one cat in every other one. Next up, place starting buildings. So you're going to take one of each building type, uh, workshop, what the heck, sawmill and recruiter, Welcome to Root, Kyle. This is a game and this is a thing from it. Um, so you're going to take one of each of those buildings and what I usually do is I shake them in my hand and I cast them like bones on the, on the board. And I kind of, the constellation that they fall on the board, I let that dictate which of the, because you have your clearing with the keep and any of the two or three clearings that might be connected to it. Um, so then you take the constellation of however the buildings fall and you just kind of distribute them. The one rule is they have to be in that keep and any of the adjacent clearings and there can only be one building per clearing. So even if they fall double stacked in your constellation and there's two slots in a clearing, there can't be more than one in each clearing. So there you go. And last but not least, you're going to fill your building track. So Easy peasy. All the rest of the recruiters, the workshops, and the, oh my goodness, and the sawmills um, are going to just go onto the building track down here. Um, and you're obviously going to leave the zero space open because those are the starting buildings you put on the map. Um, all right, so the rest of the actual that so that's the uh the berries the rules up at the top that's your setup because you'll notice there is no setup instruction on the back of the uh, clockwork expansions you know i should really just like print it out and tape it back here because that would be kind of handy um otherwise you just have this really pretty picture um so now let's get into the actual rules of the faction we're going to start with birdsong the first thing you do is reveal your order card so we talked about this in episode zero. If you haven't gone there, I would go there first so you know what an order card is because I'm not going to explain all that stuff here. So you reveal it. And as I said in that video, I usually put an order card somewhere like that one lower right hand clearing that's kind of like a triangle in the forest. That's usually my order card spot where I put it to reference and then to make sure I don't forget to put it in the discard pile. Craft, if it has an item on it and the item is still in the supply, still on the, on the map, you take that item, you get one victory point, you don't need to have any workshops on the board, doesn't cost anything, they just get it. And that's Birdsong, super simple. I told you, this bot almost runs itself. Next up, Daylight. If the order card is a bird card, you will actually perform Escalated Daylight 
And we'll get to that in a second because you won't understand why it's escalated unless we do the regular one first. So first up, you're going to battle in all ordered clearings or each ordered clearings. Um, so just the ones that come up from the order card and the defender, if there are multiple opponents in that clearing, are going to be as follows. The player with the most pieces, and our pieces is everything, warriors, buildings, and tokens. And then, second tiebreaker, the most points. And remember, if neither of the, or however many tiebreakers there are given to you, if none of them actually break the tie, the final tiebreaker in terms of faction decision is setup order. So if you have someone who had, they have both have two pieces and they are both at 20 points on the, on the track, then you go to whoever sets up first, that breaks the tie. Just like if clearings have multiple tiebreakers that all kind of come to a lock, the final tiebreaker is highest priority. So there's always going to be a definitive way to, to you know, break the tie. You don't have to flip a coin or anything like that. Next up, recruit. You're going to recruit four warriors evenly amongst the ordered clearings that you rule. So not just, they don't get to just pop up. Um, this is not the Woodland Alliance. Um, you don't get to turn other people into lizards. They have to have rule in those clearings, um, which means the next part is really important. If you rule three such clearings, place the fourth warrior in the clearing with the highest priority. So. And you might say, well, what about if you only roll two or one? It's already done for you. If you roll, if you rule all four rabbit clearings, each one gets a cat. If you rule three, each one gets a cat, and then highest priority gets a second one. If you roll two, two and two, and if you only rule one, all four cats go into that clearing. Now, if you rule zero clearings of a, whatever the uh, ordered suit is. This is not in the uh, Clockwork expansion, but in the director's cut. They make a um, Benjamin Schmaus, the guy who came up with the Better Bot project to begin with, which was the building blocks for what became the Clockwork expansion. Uh, when you get to the recruit step, for every two warriors that you can't recruit, either because you don't have any uh, clearings to recruit, or you don't have any more cats to put on the board, you get one victory point. So you can pepper that in. It is not in here. It's not in the law of robotics. But if you kind of want to uh, spice up this faction in a way that's not, you know, immediately included in the different difficulty levels uh, with this faction, try that out. So if you can't place cats for any reason, you get one victory point for every two that don't hit the board. Next up, build. You're going to build a building, <laughs> I love that, build a building in a clearing you rule with the most marquee warriors. Now, importantly, this does not have to be an ordered clearing. So just because it's a fox uh, ordered card uh, and you're going to build the fox uh, building, which is the sawmill, you don't have to put it in a fox clearing. If you have the most cats in a rabbit clearing, no problem. You put a fox building in the rabbit clearing. So, you, like it says, place a sawmill for fox, place a workshop for rabbit, and a recruiter for mouse. Boom. Fourth, you're going to move all but three of your warriors from each ordered clearing to the adjacent clearing with the most enemy pieces. So, uh, there are lots of times, especially in the beginning of the game, where there really won't be any movement happening. There will be pockets of cats that are growing, and if nothing causes them to drop down, they will boil over into uh, adjacent clearings. But, uh, and again, the clearing with the most enemy pieces, and if there's a tie, you go to the high priority. So later in the game, you'll start having, typically there's one or two or sometimes three clearings that just have, sometimes just like one, this enormous amount of cats and uh, you just wait to see where that's going to kind of go into based on where the enemy pieces build up. So the fifth and final step in daylight, expand. If you did not place a building this turn and have five or fewer buildings on the map, discard the order card, draw a new one, and repeat daylight. So this is uh, going to happen in two different ways, and it, one way it will not happen. It could, but the rules say it can't. Um, so one way is you don't have any clearings that you rule. 
you, the cats are just doing so poorly that there are there's nothing they rule, or at least there aren't any clearings they rule that have any building spaces, which is the other way. You might have a bunch of clearings that you rule, but you've already put buildings on all those uh, spaces. Now the last way that you would think this could work, but it won't, is if you've already placed down all of that order cards type of buildings. If you already have six sawmills on the map, this does not happen because it says you need to have five or fewer buildings on the map. So if you're, you're you know, only hammering one order card, and sometimes that happens. Robots just draw the same order suit over and over and over again, and you keep putting that same one out onto the map, that could happen. However, after they've already put six down, they don't get to expand because they've already expanded quite a bit. And we'll explain why that's going to be a problem in the next step. Next up, evening. And I know escalated daylight is kind of tied into daylight, but evening comes first in the law of robotics. There are two steps. One, you're going to score victory points of the rightmost exposed space on the ordered uh, building track. So if you had foxes for the ordered card and you already had two sawmills on the board, that means you would score one victory point. Pretty simple. Now, if the uh, ordered card is a bird card, you're going to see which of these suits is going to score the most. So if you only have two sawmills and two workshops, but you have four recruiting centers on the board, that means your fourth one is three points and they score three points. So you can see why if you already have all six of any building on the board and they're scoring five points a turn, they don't need any help from escalating because they are already doing pretty well scoring those five victory points. The second step is discarding your order card. It's almost uniform throughout all the root bots, almost, and we'll get to that in a different time. Finally, escalated daylight. So this is, as you might imagine, the same thing as daylight, but a little bit different. Escalated, if you will. So first up, you're going to battle in each clearing. Now notice, it's not in any order clearing. Well, I guess technically it is, because birds are wild. So you're just battling everywhere. The cats lay waste to everything. And this does not matter, no matter how like lopsided and not in the cat's favor the battles may be, they will take every fight they've got coming. The defender uh, ties is the exact same as before. Player with the most pieces, then the most points, and then set up after that. Second, recruit. You're going to recruit two warriors in each of the two clearings you rule with the lowest priority. And if you rule only one clearing, you're going to place all four warriors there. A little bit different, uh, you know, way of kind of getting your cats onto the board. As you might imagine, since moving is oftentimes going to go up the priority scale, putting those two cats in each of the two clearings that you rule of lowest priority just gives them the most upward mobility as they move. There are reasons why they might move to a lower priority clearing, but in a lot of cases, it's gonna slowly trickle upwards in the priority order. So putting them at the bottom gives them the most bang for their buck. Third, building. And build a building type um, with the most pieces on the map. In a clearing, you rule with the most Marquis Warriors. Um, so we got a couple of ties breakers here. On a tie between sawmills and any other building type, place a sawmill. If there's a tie between workshops and recruiters, but not sawmills, place a recruiter. So if you had two of each, you would place the third sawmill because that's a tie that sawmills break ties. If there were two sawmills but three of each of the other ones, then you're going to place the recruiter, not the workshop. So sawmill breaks all ties, recruiter breaks ties that are only here if they're in the lead, and workshop gets left behind. Womp womp. Lastly but not leastly, number four, move all but three warriors from each clearing to the adjacent clearing with the most enemy pieces. Then battle in each clearing you moved into. Now, this is an important uh, time to go back to paragraph 2.4 in the Law of Robotics of the action order. So there is probably going to be most of the times this happens, there will be multiple moves taking place. First of all, no, they will not move, say, from clearing one to, like, let's say, clearing three, 
and then battle there, still have more than three cats, move, and then battle there. It, it's not a roving party of cats because you'll see on the rule, it ends in a period. You're going to move all of your warriors to the adjacent clearing with the most enemy pieces. Stop. Then battle in each clearing you moved into. So you're going to, as the law says, if there's ever multiple instances of an action that take place at the same time, you'll always go from high priority to low. So you'll move from clearing one, then clearing two, then clearing three. Any of the clearings where there are more than three cats. And yes, that might mean that you send one, uh, you know, a few cats from uh, clearing one to a lower priority clearing. And then when it gets to that turn, they now have more than three. They can move. So cats can chain their movement, but they'll do all the moving and then they'll do the battling. And of course, uh, it's not like the first battle step. You're not battling everywhere. You're only battling in the clearings you move into. Now, despite how this might sound, you're typically not gonna see that much movement. So it's usually not too hard to keep track of the ones you moved into, but you might wanna just do something like lay a cat down or something um, to make sure you know this was a clearing you moved into in the fourth step rather than just have a potential for a battle but no one moved into it because you don't battle there. And that's the board. Um, that's everything for the Mechanical Marquise 2.0. All right, so next up I wanna give an ex the example turn that they uh, give you in the rule book. The Marquise example turn here is a great way to kind of see a lot of these concepts in action. Um, so yes, they do give you the map with all the little icons and squiggles and everything, and they do a nice job of putting a narrative in there for you, but I will not only speak the narrative, but I'll also be showing you uh, this turn in process. So you'll actually see the steps taking place as opposed to just kind of following um, the static picture on the page and uh, just reading along. So hopefully that's helpful um, and let's get at it. All right, so this is the marquee example turn. Now one quick thing, first of all, I have a little bit of a cold, sorry about the sound, uh, but second thing is that this is how the map is laid out in the actual book. But it says that the marquise is taking the first turn of the game, which would mean there would be one additional cat up there in the keep uh, clearing because that is one setup change from the uh, human played Mar Marquise faction as opposed to the mechanical Marquise 2.0. So um, there's one other thing that is, uh, I believe, a little bit of a typo. It's not a huge deal, um, but that one is because it definitely shows exactly how many warriors are here. So there should be two where the keep is. But aside from that, let's get started. The Mechanical Marquise 2.0 takes the first turn of the game. First, it draws and reveals a card. Root T. There it is. This is the order card. So for me, I usually put it here in the woodland because it's just kind of my spot. It's just big enough for a card so I can keep it there to reference and discard later. Since this card has an item, the actual root T, the bot crafts it. So there is one in the supply and takes the item from the supply. It doesn't need to activate or even have any workshops to do this. It scores only one victory point, even though root T is two. Then the bot goes to daylight. The bot would battle, but it cannot. The order card is Fox card and no Fox clearings have enemy pieces. So if there are no battles to be had, you just skip the battle part of daylight. Next, the bot recruits four warriors, placing one in each of the fox clearings that it rules. And at the beginning of the game, it rules all four of them. Then the bot builds. Several clearings now have two warriors in them. Clearings one, 12, eight, and six. Clearings one slots are all filled up. So it's skipped and the bot will build in the clearing with the next highest priority, which between these three would be six. The order card is fox card, so it places a sawmill. 
It doesn't move because no clearing has more than three Marquis warriors. Likewise, it does not expand because it placed a building this turn. In evening, the bot scores one victory point. Boop. The Fox Order card means that it scores from sawmills, and since it has two sawmills on the map, it scores one victory point. So this is the other small typo that I mentioned that says, and it has one sawmill on the map. It has one point's worth of sawmills, but that means it actually has two sawmills that have to be removed. So again, extremely small typo, um, but pointed out there. Finally, the order card is discarded. And that's it. So it does give you a reminder. Remember, clearing priority. Uh, if a bot takes an action and must choose between multiple clearings and the actions rule doesn't list any other criteria, the target uh, target the clearing with the highest priority. So when it's building, it just says to build in the clearing you rule with the most uh, Marquise Warriors, which is obviously one. But since there were no slots, it went down to the twos, and that's when we went 12, 8, 6. Highest priority, boom, gets a sawmill. And that's the example turn. That leaves some cards to talk about. So first up, because of the um, clockwork expansion, the difficulty cards, uh, well, are handled with cards. Better Bot Project has the different variables that they use to scale the difficulty, not so with at least Clockwork 1. So for the cats, if you want to play an easier version, whenever you recruit, instead place only two warriors. So remember, we're just placing four warriors split amongst the ordered clearings you rule. Um, or in Escalated Daylight, you're putting two and two. So in this one, you're only placing two warriors. And um, yes, that would mean putting two warriors in the lowest priority clearing you rule in Escalated Daylight, not splitting it up. Um, so yeah, kind of a huge nerf to the faction. Challenging, because remember, the board is normal. That is the neutral setting. So you can make it easier, and you can make it harder by two levels. So challenging says, whenever you recruit, also place two warriors in the ordered clearing you rule of the highest priority. So you're recruiting six cats each turn instead of just four. So nightmare says exactly the same thing as challenging, except as is the case with all the rest of the root bots from clockwork one, it just adds a simple sentence after that. At the end of evening, score one victory point. So remember in episode zero, we talked about how typically one victory point was like shaved off of uh, the kind of scoring potential for each of the factions. And that's, that's uh, kind of amalgamated from all the actions, the battling, the moving, the building, the scoring, whatever it is. Um, roughly one victory point per turn was scaled back from the rules that we see in the clockwork expansion. So this is obviously one way to get that back. You also are putting down those two extra cats. So no one's going to, you know, send the board game police to your house if you want to put the victory point buff on, but you don't want the extra cat recruit buff. I don't know. I I think Nightmare is kind of fun, um, but if you don't want just like that cheesy extra victory point, challenging is there for you as well. Next up, traits. I think I'm going to do this with all of the faction uh, trait cards. I'm going to put them in order of uh, how much I like them to, or, you know, most to least liked by me. <laughs> that was the hardest way I could have said that. Um, so first up, Blitz. After you move, find the clearing you rule of highest priority with no enemy pieces. Move all but one warrior from that clearing. Then battle in the destination clearing. I love this one. Um, it makes the cats kind of just come across as uh, just kind of impatient and wanting to get stuck in battle. It's like a little mini escalated daylight all the time, but yes, it also happens in escalated daylight. So I really like Blitz. The only problem is there are times when uh, your highest priority clearing with no enemy pieces is the keep, and then the keep just goes burp over to a new spot, and it's, it takes a while for them to make it to a point where they're actually going to engage. Um, but even still, 
it's just kind of an extra threat that I really like about uh, adding to the, it's probably the one I've added the most when I'm using mechanical marquees. Next up, Iron Will. Whenever you recruit in Escalated Daylight, place double the warriors. So this is just kind of bonkers. Um, Escalated Daylight, obviously, uh, by the numbers, should only come out a fourth of the time. Um, from game to game, that varies. I had one game where of you know five turns, three of them were Escalated Daylight, so that was kind of wild. Uh, I can't remember if I had this in play or not. If I did, that would have been insane because that's eight warriors coming out, four in each of your lowest priority clearings. That makes a huge difference on the game. Um, but it only happens in Escalated Daylight, so, you know, it, it obviously makes it so it's not just, like, insanely powerful, but also there are sometimes games where it just never happens, and that's kind of a bummer. Next up, Fortified. Your buildings each take two hits to remove. Taking a single hit with a building has no effect. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, has no effect. So this one is pretty cool. Um, I mean, I like the theme of it, like the, the, the fluff, that they're putting extra bulk, like extra armor on their building or whatever. Um, and it does make an interesting, if you are going up against that as a human player, it does put an interesting twist on things from, uh, obviously, you know, you don't get just like the automatic removal if it's an uncontested building or an undefended building. You need to at least score one other hit, otherwise it still stays, even though there are no cats to protect it. Um, so I do like it, but the problem that I come across is when you're running multiple bots and the cats are one and there are other ones in addition to them and fortify is in play, that just means there's a bunch of time when the robot doesn't have the wherewithal to respond to it, to put extra bodies or attack more times or whatever. Um, so it just means that the buildings stay on the board really long, which in the long run probably isn't the worst thing in the world because the cats aren't a super high scoring bot typically. Um, so keeping buildings on the board longer is going to help them out. But yeah, I really like the first two. So the fact that this is third isn't that it's like bad. It's just not as fun as the others. Last up, hospitals. Now I'm going to explain why this is last, I promise. So don't at me just yet. At the end of the battle as defenders, if two or more Marquise warriors were removed in the battle, place two warriors in the clearing with the keep token. Now, strictly thematically... And if I were guaranteed to always remember to do this, this would probably be first or second place in my, you know, ranking of the traits. However, and I am a big proponent of putting these cards either next to the player board or on the map somewhere or wherever your game of root is going to be the most pertinent for you to remember the trait card, that's where you put it. I don't put this somewhere uniform, like for if I'm playing three bots, I'm going to put their, th their three trait cards in different places depending on what they do. I have not found a successful place to put hospitals where I do not forget it. That may come from the same part of my brain where I have not successfully remembered that hospitals are a thing when I am playing the cats every game. Some games I do. Sometimes I do just in time for a big battle, but there are a bunch of times when it has been multiple turns, and I remembered either this or that I'm playing the cats, that that's an option for me, and I feel dumb, um, especially if there was a time when there were a bunch of cats that died, and I missed that opportunity. So to me, hospitals has to be fourth place because it's the hardest for me to implement correctly. I know that's on me, but I'm the one making the list, so makes sense for me to do that. So that's the Mechanical Marquis 2.0. Um, like I said, this is a great bot to start with, kind of ease into the world of Rootbotics. It is the bot I've absolutely played the most with um, because its reach value is so big, it makes a lot of game matchups viable. Um, it's also low overhead in terms of what you have to remember. You draw a card, just boom, 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 boom go down to daylight, and then you move on. Hopefully, the goal of this series is for me to show you that really piloting these bots, if you take the game literally and you, you know, grok some of these bigger or deeper or more uniformly applied concepts, 
they should all hopefully feel that way that you draw the order card you walk your way down the board and then you go on to the next thing um, the the ideal is that they're so simple that no part of your backing background like processing power has to be what you're going to do for the bots when it's your turn you can focus on you and maybe if there's another human player you can focus on what they're doing and then when it comes time for the bots turn you flip a card go through the steps and the board state has been changed in some way and now the puzzle is back into your side of the court so um i think like i said the cats they may not be the highest scoring of the bots but you can always bump that up in a couple of different ways that i talked about and i think they're a great place to start so hopefully this is helpful and thanks again for taking a pause, a give pause, and we will see you next time for the Electric Eerie. See you, everybody.